thank you for joining us. My name is Brianne Bradley, Curatorial Assistant in the Contemporary Art Department at LACMA and part of the curatorial team for Black American Portraits, an exhibition that reframes portraiture to center Black American subjects, sitters, and spaces. This series, Five Questions for Five Artists, has included conversations between artists in the exhibition, such as Jordan Castile, Titus Kafar, Lyle Ashton Harris, and Leslie Saar with LACMA curators and educators. Each artist will be presented with the same five key questions about portraiture, exploring how this art form functioned historically in an encyclopedic collection, while also providing us with new perspectives on representation. Uh, please use the Q&A function to ask any questions for the presenters, but also including any technical questions. We'll review our questions at about 12.40 uh, when we'll start the Q&A. So today I have the pleasure of introducing Paul Mpagi Sapuya, whose work Dark Room Mirror Study from 2017 is currently included in Black American Portraits. An artist working in photography whose projects weave together histories and possibilities of portraiture, queer and homoerotic networks of production and collaboration, and the material and conceptual potential of Blackness at the heart of the medium. He often combines multiple images on a single plane using mirrors and reflective surfaces so that disparate scenes of body parts and fabrics collapse into one. In Dark Room Mirror Study, the artist's hand reaches into the picture plane to press the release button on a camera aimed at a shiny surface marked by a multitude of overlapping fingerprints. Emotionally, these are about touch, physical longing, and obfuscation. Intellectually, the viewer builds an understanding of the relationship between the artist, who is often included in the image, and male subjects. Born in San Bernardino in 1982, Sophia lives and works in Los Angeles. He lived in New York for nearly a decade before returning to Southern California, where he received his MFA in photography from UCLA in 2016. In 2018, he had a solo exhibition at Soto Museum Amsterdam titled Double Enclosure and a survey of work from 2006 to 2018 at the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis. He's been in multiple group exhibitions, including Trigger, Gender as a Tool and Weapon at the New Museum, Storefront, Public Fiction at the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, and Being, New Photography 2018 at the Museum of Modern Art. So welcome, Paul. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you, Brianne, for that introduction. It's wonderful to be here. I'm going to jump to the first image of my work that you were describing. Um, but sorry, I just want to continue saying thank you to, to everyone for having me as part of this program and also part of the exhibition. Um, it really feels like a, it really felt like a family reunion of sorts mm -hmm. um, of networks of, of um, friendship and collaboration and mentorship. Um, so it's just a really beautiful exhibition. Um, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, it's been wonderful to see all of the artists um, reconvening for many after years or meeting for the first time. Uh, it's very intergenerational. But um, when considering the framework of the exhibition, we chose a more expansive definition of considering portraits, portraiture, and portrayals. So I'd like to ask, um, what makes something a portrait to you? How do you define portraiture? <laughs> That is such a good question and something that my work has really been focused on for the last like 16 years or so, I would say. Um, I'm gonna jump to this next image in response to that question. This work drop scene um, underscore one of three of four four two from 2018. Um, it is a double portrait it is part of a, a series of work that had an entanglement and moving from working alongside to collaboration with um, a dear friend and also fellow artist in the show, Clifford Prince King. Um, and we've known each other for several years. And I like to, I, I wanted to show this work to, um, to kind of emphasize something that I've really thought about portraiture that separates just depictions of people. So I think when I started mm -hmm. making pictures of people or maybe what I 
initially thought were portraits in my years in undergrad and just after you know New York I, re I realized at the time I was really using making images of people as um, a one-way vector of looking and questioning and I think something that really developed um, because I don't work with models, because I'm working with my inquiries always been about friends, friendship, collaboration, creative and erotic exchange, all of these things that there has to be sort of a mutual invest investment in the work. Mm -hmm. um, at least for me, there's always an ongoing interest, relationship um, and fascination with the work. And I'm really interested in the way in which um, returning to making images with and of and alongside these friends. Um, yeah, and so, you know, I think about like the, the yeah. I looked up the definition of portrait <laughs> right before, you know, we all do our, you know, quick. Me too, yeah. What is, what, is the, what does the dictionary say? You know, I, and I wrote down, it says like, it's to display a likeness, personality, or even mood about a person. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of really let go of that um, I am not so sure that the individual work carries that as much as the process of revisiting the work, the editing, the selection, there's so many forces outside of a single image. Um, and so I've really let go of their, you know, this image, we don't have a clear depiction of either of our faces. In many of the works that I consider portraits, there may not be a face or a body at all. Um, but there's something that's kind of, that's tied to the subject. Um, and I think of portraiture as the practice, and then there's all these works that come out of it. Um, and they may or may not be figurative. Mm -hmm. And I think in this show and in your work, I start to think of portraits of places as well. Mm -hmm. And I know that historically we think of that as, you know, a landscape or a genre scene, but there's something about the image of yours that's in this show and, and maybe a few other pieces, like I think of the Reggie Burroughs Hodges, um, Swimming in Compton, but the place adds to the essence of the person mm -hmm. and is almost just as informative as the representation of the individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, for, I, I think all of the images I'm gonna be showing are made except for one, which was made in my um, home in Brooklyn in 2005, all of the images that I'm showing today were made in my studio in Los Angeles. Um, and I found it interesting the way in which place influences portrait portraiture. I've never made, mm -hmm. for example, a work that one would identify as this is a Los Angeles portrait or this is an, a Brooklyn portrait, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I'm not making images in the, I'm not for the most part making works in the landscape, right, or in a, right, you know, but so the, the the location of the studio really becomes a framework for how the various images and works that come out of making portraits function. I feel like that kind of becomes, mm -hmm. it really is a stage. Um, the last exhibition that I did in Chicago was called Stage, really thinking about that as a place in which portraits are made, but also as we enter into it, we're always in relation to whether it's just having a mental image or awareness of, of those works that preceded our entering onto the mm -hmm. stage, or perhaps there's, you know, as we're making works like this, there are lots of unfinished pieces up, you know, there are fragments of things. Yeah. There's this way in which every portrait is really responding to a whole network of other um, images that might be generated by the artist or might be the, those research notes, the things that we pin up that mm -hmm. were influenced by, um, the books that are, that are sitting on the desktop. Um, yeah, so the place really becomes, I think, about is, is, is that recurring site where people gather. You know, mm -hmm. I've, I've returned to New York and made makeshift studios, or I've traveled to other places and made makeshift studios, and they, um, and it, and it's, really the people that define the place. Right, and with this, when you realize or are told it's Clifford, um, that kind of points to it being a Los Angeles portrait, right? Because mm -hmm. that's something that you made when you came to LA and you had that connection and the place that you both make work in. Mm -hmm. So there is like that nod to 
this Los Angeles era of your life mm -hmm. um, by, by knowing that information. So um, I'll transfer to the next question, but some yep. say this is a pretty transformative time for art museums. I think that's a debatable notion, but given the <laughs> pandemic and ongoing conversations about diversity and equity and inclusion, um, what has it been like to think about your work in this moment, if you even feel that it's being received differently, um, or if you even really feel like this moment is as um, intense and divisive and this move towards diversity and equity and inclusion that people are saying it is? Okay, <laughs> that is another really- I know. Glad you- Heavy glad you question. It. It's, you know, there's, uh, you know, to be honest, it's really complicated and I have a very ambivalent relationship to um, to the subject um, and particularly who's being asked to do the work and what kind of mm -hmm. work or artists practices are, are being asked to kind of carry it through. Um, and, you know, like I said, I was really, I'm really excited about this show. It, really is like a family reunion. Um, but I, you know, my ultimate aim for my work has kind of been to infiltrate the history of photography, the history of the, of, uh, uh, the history of artists in studio production in a way that inserts blackness, but blackness as a subjective position or blackness as material as inseparable from those histories. I'm a little, I'm, right. I guess what I'm saying in terms of like where my ambivalence comes from is, you know, I, I, you know, there's waves of, of, of focus on representation and of, um, and, you know, they'll swing between that and abstraction or, you know, mm -hmm. run DEI, there's going to be backlashes. We're already seeing backlashes in many other ways, but I feel like in being able to tie the essential the essential in inseparableness of of uh, of blackness outside of what can easily be identified as like a social construct into the mm -hmm. medium into those histories itself. You know, um, you could walk into an exhibition that's that you know, or I guess you could say at, I would like to get to a point where no curator could make a work attempting to strictly be about a technical history of the medium or let's say of a specific space and be and um where it, where it is required to include um work made by black hands work mm -hmm. that is that um you know so yeah i'm uh, yeah it's a <laughs> it's a large it's a large I, so i understand you know, what are that because I think about the show a lot because it's been my primary focus for the past 12 months. And now that it's on the walls, sometimes I think about what if we tried to tackle a history of portraiture in general and inserted these voices in a way that they haven't been inserted, mm -hmm. not necessarily highlighting just Black artists or Black subjects and sitters. I mean, that would be an ambitious overhaul um, that would probably need to take up the entire museum mm -hmm. and that we couldn't do alone with our collection. Mm -hmm. But that's the goal, right? The goal is this show is kind of that stepping stone in getting there and realizing that that history mm -hmm. is broad and it doesn't need to just be a show about Black artists and Black sitters. It can be about inserting Blackness where mm -hmm. it rightfully has been in history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, like the reason why I put this image up is there's, we have like two, there's, there's two, actually there might be several more figures located within this work. Um, but there are several black figures. There is fragments of white figures or what appears to be a white body. Um, something that's interesting that happens in a lot of my images where there are fragments is, um, Fragments of, of other black bodies where a face isn't identifiable have oftentimes been collapsed or presumed to be self-portraits, 
or mm -hmm. images or fragments of bodies that are lighter skinned or maybe Asian or Latinx are have been described as white. So there's this sort of like erasure that happens. I'm like really interested, particularly because I've, you know, I've centered portrait making, like portrait making is at the center of my practice, but I've never made projects where I set out to say, this is a body of work that is defining, let's say, queer Black people in Los Angeles at this given time. Like right. my, you know, we all have different personal histories and biographies. I've had a very, you know, I, the, the people that I've been making work with has never been defined by race. And this uh -huh. also the larger question also in terms of, of sexuality and gender as well. Um, so, you know, just as a side note, I always say the work is made from the position of, of um, understanding how homoerotic spaces come together, but it's not necessarily defining the sexual orientation or the gender of the subject. In the same way as I'm interested right. in the Black position as a place for making work, but that the subjects that come, that enter into that are, are mm -hmm. not, it's not concerned about what their, what their, um, their uh, social construct of race is. But I'm really mm -hmm. interested in how those images are interpreted and what happens when a work by a Black artist may not feature a Black subject at its center and how that can be understood as Black art. Like I, I you know, I even look back to like Augustus Washington in the 19th century, who was, you know, set up, had a portrait studio in Washington, D.C., a free Black man, the very contentious time, who was making portraits of white people. And just sort of like that right. power dynamic becomes really like that, it's it's embedded in his Black pos the position, and it can only come out through that, that like exchange, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Of course he goes out, you know, he makes those really beautiful um, portraits um, in Liberia, um, afterwards, but I'm really interested in in kind of that. Like, can we turn can we turn black kind of like um, uh, what's the what's the word like interrogation? Can we turn black interrogation mm -hmm. onto other like subjects and that kind of be um, a big part of it, rather than having images of black people being the sole thing to carry the 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 weight. Right. And I think that's why I've always thought of your work as conceptual mm -hmm. photography, because much like, you know, the first generation, second generation conceptual artists, you're thinking about the reception um, of the work. And by making those decisions, you're not saying, here's a black hand and a white hand. And I thought, you know, and I want you to identify this. You're curious about that response. And that response is so telling of people in general and society, but also of those individuals. Um, but your work really allows for a broad interrogative conversation around those ideas and spaces. Um, so thinking of your career, um, when you look back at your earlier work, what do you see now that's different from what you saw then? Mm. And I guess I'll let you define earlier, whether that's <laughs> you know, right out of school um when you first picked up a camera yeah okay I feel like there's I could probably f think of five earlier periods you know it's interesting to have yeah. um you know I've been making work like this portrait from 2005 my friend Nick was made mm -hmm. um right at the beginning of my first you know where a body of work that had yet to really sort of be defined. I just started making portraits of people that I was getting to know, friends, um, a new, mostly queer social circle mm -hmm. in um, it, there in New York. And Nick here had was a, as a writer had reached out actually to interview to to pitch an interview for Butt Magazine. <laughs> It was sort of like this first kind of like Love introduction it. into that sort of through this sort of like scene role. But I think of like that as a as a as a sort of like early moment of just the uh the initial portraits as sort of discrete works where I think the idea mm -hmm. that I that definition of like a likeness usually depicting the face to capture the personality and or mood of the subject, that's what I was sort of trusting on. Um but then I, you know. Um, you know, my whole 
my whole practice, I always, even though I'm almost 20 years into making work, practice still feels like a funny thing to say um, when, yeah. it, when, when thinking in retrospect, but like, you know, at a, my, my practice has always been about like going back and looking at earlier work and then contending with it and then making work after that. So like looking back at a certain point, this became the earlier work and I was, and, and my looking back on it, I realized that the work was about the complications of the production of portraiture. Uh -huh. Later on, looking back, as I moved into a student making work in a studio space, it became about how that the, the studio becomes a site of accumulation and reconstruction and recontextualization and really bringing and that was the, the time when I started bringing work that had already circulated out in the world, mainly through zines and these other sort of like emerging social networks back into the studio to recontextualize them. Um, and then it's interesting around 2017, when some of the work that I'd made in and just after grad school started getting like a whole other type of reception, um, there was almost sort of like a career reset in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the media of a sense, um, where I was really wanting to return, where I felt it necessary to return to reasserting the portrait at the center because all the the sort of collage quote unquote collage works or abstraction had kind of come to the forefront and it almost seemed like um the the portraits were sort of being erased or all of that sort of history right. um because i always said that you know even when you're looking at work that seems abstract or fragmented it cannot have been made without a foundation of portraiture and ongoing mm -hmm social collaborative, creative and collaborative exchange, right? Um, and those aren't just spouting out of nowhere. They're still, they're building on work like this. And I still see it as a part yeah. of it. So it's interesting looking back at earlier work. Um, I've been, I've, it's been interesting to see a lot of like, like literally growing up together, <laughs> you know, with uh -huh. some projects I have, I have portraits of some friends you know, taken at intervals that now, you know, 16 years may have passed or 10 or five years. Um, and I've also seen gaps. Like, I think it's been really interesting being a teacher and doing, you know, like visiting artist talks to, you know, especially with mm -hmm. like grads and grad students where the, conversa the conversations have changed. Like there's an awareness of, of, I think, kind of the responsibility of what it means to put work out into the world. And so, Right. Uh, I've been really grateful for those conversations that have led me to realize like some of those gaps in earlier work about, you know, um, and really just sort of like following, following, um, uh, following the people who are leading these, these conversations. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. No. And was there, was it grad school or was it 2017 when you started to consider and introduce the, the fabric and the process and the fingerprints, because this is a very, like you said, direct portrait. Mm -hmm. Was there a moment? Was there a discovery or, or like a aha moment for you? Yeah. So, you know, when I left, so I lived in New York for 14 years and then I moved back in to, to California in 2014. And for the three years before that, I had really struggled and I had, I was working without a studio or really sort of like access to labs or print spaces. I had uh -huh. a lot of sort of like unresolved material. And so I came back, I, I, I ended up having a studio in grad school for the first time in, in three or four years. And I wanted to find a space to, to be able to make sense of all that material. If this makes sense. I could jump to another image, but <laughs> that might be a little too confusing, but I hope everyone who's listening can follow along. I had boxes of all of this sort of just like test prints, Xeroxes, just like the things that I could easily have produced to just like look at my, at these images that I was making out in the mm -hmm. world. And I wanted to rephotograph them as a way of organizing them spatially into an image that I could resolve. I kind of wanted to return to that initial promise of photography that it could provide, like uh, it could like affix meaning or resolve something. Uh -huh. 
And so I would gather all of these fragments of material, but I wanted a surface that I would have to look at myself while photographing. Even if I didn't stay in the picture, even if I set the camera on a tripod and walked away, or I could stay in the picture and like press the shutter, like I would, I still considered those self portraits, but it allowed me to, mm -hmm. to the background of the images to be the studio that I was working in. And so you could see the gradual shifts and change the things that were on the walls or on the floors while having these discrete arrangements. But the thing that happened with that work is as I'm handling all this material, my fingerprints were smudging the mirrors. And at first I was like compulsively like windexing them right. down and trying to get it like big or perfect, perfect, quote unquote. But mm -hmm. then it, that, that, that sort of perfection led people to assuming that the work was a digital construction. And so there were moments where I would miss a smudge and the only time you could see those smudges is when there was something black in the image reflecting. Either the camera, which was black, because I was using a Mamiya, um, mm -hmm. or, if my, or if I stayed in the picture and my body intercepted a smudge that was left. And, you know, I didn't plan thinking about the, this, that kind of like, you know, it, it, right. I feel like so many things can only happen by accident, but what I, what that led to was realizing that there's all of this sort of like, and I guess we're kind of, we're kind of jumping a little ahead to something I was thinking about for the last image, but that's fine. Is that conceptually, I was like, oh, wow, there's how wonderful to, to have this like moment realizing that through this process of labor and creativity, but also social exchange and collaboration, there's all this sort of like latent traces that are mm -hmm. otherwise like, literally erased or made invisible when the reflecting surface is the white walls of the studio or just thinking about like whiteness as like a, as sort of like in a hierarchy of priorities but that mm -hmm. against blackness or against black material because it was I liked that it could be interchangeably the introduction of this black velvet or my body or the camera like the black velvet isn't a social construct it's not a race the, the camera is not a social but but I, I liked kind of like moving between material identity, what is visible, you know, but that that black, these black materials could make possible all of this otherwise latent and invisible traces of like people so that you could have this sort of like beautiful thing happening. And so then I just started having fun with it. I just started playing around with yeah. it. Um, maybe I could jump to the next image. Actually, yeah. I'm gonna jump ahead if that's all right to That's just kind totally of fine. just this image. I, I apologize for the for the quick jump, but like in this picture we see like something that I'm really interested in is continuing to use these mirrors, but refusing through refusing the view, the viewer of the final image who's positioned where the camera is of seeing mm -hmm. the subject's interaction with the camera or the thing that the I mean, the subject's interaction with the mirror, the reflecting surface, and the and what the the mirror is itself reflecting. So this sort of like triangulating position. Um, yeah, it's a <laughs> maybe we jump. Which is yeah. no, but it's interesting because it all goes back to the the technicalities of a camera, mm -hmm. right? And light and the angle, and there's almost. I mean, I almost see a camera when looking at this image because of the triangular nature. Mm -hmm. um, but what's also interesting is that you had this kind of process of discovery that was really inspired by practicality and, and you just having a studio and then exploring that and then realizing that perfection wasn't the goal and creating these mm -hmm. perfect portraits wasn't necessarily the type of portraiture photography that you needed to make or that needed to be made. Um, and I think that opens up space for more artists and students and individuals to look at portraiture in a much more expansive way, which I think is how it should be mm -hmm. looked at. Um, mm -hmm. And I think of earlier, you said pictures of people. And I, I think of Alice Neal because she was a Marxist all of her life and felt <laughs> that portraits Portraits were connected to like power and building people up and these religious figures or political figures 
So when you say pictures of people, you're thinking a lot more about the subjectivity of the individual and the space that they inhabit um, instead of just conveying this idea or this illusion of grandeur. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Like, I hadn't thought about it through Alice Neal's language. I mean, I love that work. Um, and yeah. it's, it's interesting because there have been a few portraits that I've made that have been based off of Alice Neal's paintings. Oh, interesting. Um, where I've, um, I've began by sort of in conversation with a friend, sort of positioned them in relation to one of those paintings. A lot, there's a lot of references that kind of come that are sort of embedded that I'm not directly addressing. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, so, but, but also thinking about, you know, what she's talking about of um, portraits being tied to power and building people up is I think, I guess I had, I've thought of portraits as for me tied to this idea of like an ongoing responsibility towards the subject and ideally mm -hmm. a mutual investment. But I understand what she's talking about there because I think there's the way in which we construct a, a portrait oftentimes in reference to an archetype of power, whether it is like a culturally defined one as in like a Greco-Roman ideal is the thing. And so we're going to construct mm -hmm. image of someone who has been disenfranchised in the likeness or in the same sort of like structure as someone who has been in power to then define you know like yeah or it could just be in relation to celebrity or whatever it is but um yeah I think I'm gonna have to kind of like sit on that think that through we, we can talk more <laughs> yeah. about Alice later yeah. um but yeah but just in that we just talked about Alice what do you envision for the future of portraiture? What themes, topics, discussions mm -hmm. do you think will be prevalent in the future? Um, we could say of art by Black artists, but maybe just in general. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, I have no idea. Hopefully it's something that surprises me and is just like mm -hmm. beyond what I could have sort of anticipated. Um, I love that. I, I, I love that feeling. Um, I hope that regardless of what kind of like develops that one of the strengths of portraiture and I think of like looking at work like in exhibitions like this is seeing those echoes and patterns across time that like mm -hmm. how much ingenuity there is and like we're all working within this, hu this human condition and of course there's like varying you know social and political and it, you know other conditions around us, but that there are these kind of concerns that we revisit. Um, I was showing um, in a class, I was I was showing something of Wolfgang Tillmans in a photo class the other day, and he said something about like making these photos that he made of um, windowsills, you know, and he's like, mm -hmm. if someone in Spain painted a windowsill 300 years ago, and then someone took a photograph of a windowsill in 18... 50 and then he's making one now it's that that there's something about that space on between the inside and the outside and the way in which mm. we're positioned and that we're going to continue returning to it that it's not you know um and I think it's also uh that we will continue to build off of um and expand these uh these genres um yeah, I had some notes on like, sorry, as I, I was like taking notes before and I'm like looking to sort of read them. I'm, I'm actually hoping that like, um, that kind of like, if we were to define sort of like black art, that it becomes as, ex that it becomes as expansive as the entire world, kind of returning to that thing I said before where it's like, if the position of, Black subjectivity looking out is the definition. It's like, mm -hmm. like, you know, that there is Black art that is just like taking pictures of rocks <laughs> or a landscape, you know, there's right. black art that is just like a still life. There's Black art that is, that, um, uh, that it is not just tied to, um, to, uh, uh, 
of kind of like an internal loop of just black artists making images of black subjects that mm -hmm. the entire world can feel itself under the eye and and the inquisition or in, in, inquisition is not a good word the the, the curiosity or the yeah. um or the uh uh the the, the gaze of, of of black subjectivity Mm -hmm. I mean, I almost hope that it will just become so undefinable, right, that they'll stop having to think about it that way. It'll just be work by so-and-so, right, not just thinking of him or them first and foremost as a Black artist, but thinking about their practice. Mm -hmm. And then thinking, you know, of course, about how their position in the world um, affects the work that they make. But I just, I hope that it the way that I want portraiture to be thought of in an expansive way, I think that Black art should be thought of as well. Mm -hmm. um, so in thinking about, now you've seen the show, um, what do you want people to take away um, after seeing your work um, in this context, in this exhibition? Because we talked about connection and I think that's a major, um, not necessarily a theme, but something that's prevalent in the exhibition is these familial or mentor-like relationships, mm -hmm. connections, people who, like you and Clifford, have been in one another's images. You know, there's so much connection, but what do you want people to take away from it? Yeah, I'm going to switch images. I'm going to jump back just because we kind of didn't get to see this yeah. one. Um, which, yeah, I like this one because it rests in the sort of like ambiguity of sort of a desire to kind of identify subjects where we're only kind of given this little, these little sort of like cuts. But um, because I hope if people have never seen my work or just kind of coming to it for the first time in the context of this show is, um, yeah, that something that just kind of comes down to the piece that's in there that, um, that, you know, in that work, it's, it's directing or it's, it's positioning the viewer like as on the receiving end of looking. Um, mm -hmm. But also, you know, the one element of the body that is in there is the hand that's operating that camera. And I'm not sure if, how many other works in the show have as little of the body in them um but that you know in walking around mm -hmm. it kind of becomes a surprise that yeah. you're like oh you know I'm hoping that it that it does start to like ask that question um and think about like the black hand controlling the device like thinking about, again, that, um, you know, what you see prominently in the image is the is the, the blur of the smudges on that surface and start to think about, well, what what is that? And then hopefully kind of like, um, you know, because when you look close, you can see that the camera is flipped. It's in reverse so that you start to mm -hmm. see that okay, this thing is pointed out towards me. I'm being implicated by this device, but actually I'm looking at a closed, it's already sort of like a closed loop. I'm looking at the, the surface of a mirror and then realizing that what, that this sort of like ghostly image again is actually only visible because of, because of my hand and that black velvet mm -hmm. that makes it visible. That, that, maybe bit by bit it kind of starts to kind of like expand the idea of um of the portrait yeah it's like it, it's a yeah. interesting work to include in a portraiture show um but what i like is yeah. that that room is full of spaces and, mm -hmm. and bodies but when you get through all of that and get to your work you go back to the camera right i don't think the camera is present physically in any other image mm -hmm. but we're having this large conversation about the history of photography mm -hmm. um in this room or trying to because to me that's such a ambitious 
um, thing to do, but then you just go back to, oh, the camera, the maker, you know, the hand. Um, so I think it's almost a moment to breathe in the exhibition where you're, you're kind of overwhelmed and then you see the camera and you start to think about the artist again mm -hmm. and not just the finished project. Like there's a person behind all of this. Um, I guess we have two, two questions. Um, please feel free everyone to write any more questions in the Q&A. But Paul, can you talk about your teaching practice and how your work as an artist informs your pedagogy? Oh, <laughs> um, no one has ever asked this that question before. Um, my teaching. Well, so I am currently, I'm an associate professor at University of California, San Diego. And I started there in the fall of 2019. And before that, I was teaching at CalArts and at the mm -hmm. Bard um, summer MFA program. Very um, different schools. All very different schools. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, I went to NYU for my undergrad in 2000, 2004, um, where I worked with, you know, Deb Willis, who's also in the show and is just always mm -hmm. been a wonderful, um, you know, supporter, mentor, friend over the years. Um, and, you know, other professors there like Lori Novak and Adita Messina. And of course, at UCLA, working with Kathy Opie and Jim Welling, mm -hmm. um, Uta Barth. Um, and so my teaching, I think, the way I approach it is that figuring out why we pick up the camera, what we aim to look at, what questions we're trying to solve, and then actually embracing the fact that it's that that can only be an aim, but something else entirely is going to be produced. And to really be able mm -hmm. to reflect and work through that, that's kind of the way I, I, I think about, about teaching is really, you know, um, to never, to never not consider the medium, um, how it works, and to really look closely at the pictures um, and, and build, um, I think, build meaning from what is in front of us rather than hypotheticals. Um, I, yeah, I, you know, like anyone who teaches say they, they both love it. And it's also just, it's also a day job, you know, there is a way right. in which it is, um, I, I really appreciate, appreciate teaching for keeping me on my toes, keeping me, you know, mm -hmm. engaged with like amazing students, especially, you know, and, um, and it, you know, if I could just spend my time doing studio visits and really just like looking and talking at other artists' work, like I love that. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, I tend not to teach or I, I hope not to teach to like just reproduce the thing that I'm interested in, but to try to meet each student and find out what their interests are in and what their aims are and to help them think through all the aspects to get to get to that mm -hmm. to that place um yeah it's teaching is interesting it's a lot it's been it's been a challenge oh, I'm sure last you know especially this last almost two years as well with mm -hmm. everything but I it is I'm amazing I mean I wouldn't be where I am without like that one great teacher, or like those few really great teachers that are super impactful on not only your career, but your your outlook and your way of thinking. So it's yeah. just a very interesting thing to be in that position where you, you can have that potential to have those relationships and mm -hmm. kind of plant those seeds with people and just get them to think differently. Um, but it also kind of feels like a lot of responsibility. Yeah. a lot of weight yeah it's <laughs> you know there's there's only you know yeah it 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 does it does feel like that like i think just edu 
the entire sort of like education system is just really kind of complicated to deal to deal with yeah. and thinking about how to engage with that and to help students through um yeah it's really complicated but um mm -hmm. I think it's yeah I I I, I enjoy yeah. it yeah um I love this next question because I think uh when you're being educated you have to know what to take with you and what to unlearn um, so someone asked, are there any lessons in your own education you find yourself echoing or avoiding? Anything in my own education that I find myself echoing or avoiding? Um, wow. Okay. Echoing. I mean, there, there's a few things that I do, I do feel are foundational and mm -hmm. maybe that is echoing <laughs> but i but i feel right. like a found uh, um a saw like a solid technical foundation combined with critical looking mm -hmm. and an awareness of um of the medium sort of like history is important um <clears throat> let's see um things that i echo um i mean there's something that i feel like i had to unlearn in order to move forward maybe uh -huh. this is easier like i feel like when you know um i had my introduction to photography was through magazines like that 90s early internet um like zines like all of these like and total absence of hierarchy like mm -hmm. you know uh la magazine stands like you know just sort of like all of these things just like tell but i think going to going to school in my undergrad i came out with this idea that like all work had to be this sort of you know um the work wasn't complete until it was sort of like a finished portfolio box yeah of, you know, I've spent all this time making all these sort of final prints. And well, they were presented, had to be presented, right. And it's like the amount of resources that went into it, I feel like returning to this idea that images could kind of really live anywhere. And that I mm -hmm. could that um, all I had to do was just sort of like, look and see what that did it. That's kind of how I turned to make to zine making as a as an accessible way of continuing to work without the pressure of a certain kind of final form. And then in right. those years of 2011 to 2013, again, in the sort of like moment of like, of, uh, of uh, a bit of sort of art, artist, artistic practice itiner itinerancy or whatever, I kind of had to return to that again. Kind of like let go of fixed ideas of what finished work was in order to keep working. And then at moments I could bring that, and then at a certain point later on, I could bring that back into the studio. Um, that's something, but I don't know, that's a, it's a, it's it's a big question that was asked, and I I don't know if I totally answered it the way that the person may so. have asked. I think so. I, I think it takes a certain level of self awareness too to realize that you have to unlearn mm -hmm. things to to let certain things go or to realize that maybe like what you were taught isn't the only way of doing things. Yeah. Um, okay. Are there any lessons in, oh wait, I did that one already. Um, I guess that's our last one. So it's interesting that everyone's very intrigued by education mm -hmm. um, and how that's informed you and how you've perpetuated that. Um, do you find that you have, do you find that you learn a lot from your friends and fellow art makers in a way that's different from maybe what you learned in school institutionally? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm like, without a doubt, my, my inspiration, my excitement, mm -hmm. all of that comes from seeing the work of fellow artists, friends, and people who I get to know through art making. Um, and just that like, <sighs> 
you know, that's actually one of the things that I like about teaching is being able to share that work and mm -hmm. in presenting it, I spend time like diving into it and it gets me to really slow down and think about that work and those practices doing like, um, like, uh, like, like so Zoom has made it so possible to like drop into each other's classes. That that's something I really enjoyed doing yeah. with with um, with fellow friend, with fellow with fellow artists. Um, yeah, and I think that's something that I you know really liked about this show. Or you you actually brought up the the trigger show at the New Museum, mm -hmm. been in, which was you know the type of that was an exhibition that like really just like was just like over, you know, I was just like over the moon with because it was the first time that I was showing alongside so many other artists who I've been friends, like, right, you know, uh, collaborators in ways in which it uh, kind of like the under the scenes type of a thing, like people where we would sit around in our apartments and drink beers and talk about art and then go out to the club um but mm -hmm. there was these ways in which oftentimes artists practices kind of get put in their own lanes right and but in reality we're all bouncing off of each other and connecting and yes we have our own practices but um but uh context or exhibitions or all the whole sometimes the whole system kind of separates them out and so trigger was so amazing um, uh -huh. you know, to be, uh, I remember being in this room with like, there, you know, across the way was Harry Dodge, who I, you, you know, got to know while, uh, I was teaching at Cal Arts around the corner, there is, um, is A.L. Steiner and A.K. Burns and Community oh, Action amazing. Center, this like amazing project that I have this strange cameo in, but like, you know, and then around was like Ulrika Muller, who, um, you know, sort of, th there are all these sort of like people that, that was like, it was really like a mapping um, of these, this really amazing sort of like social space. Um, mm -hmm. And a that, dialogue. A di yeah, a yeah, yeah, a, a, a really kind of like shared dialogue of influence and inspiration. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yeah, I feel like Trigger did that. It acknowledged that underlying dialogue that was mm -hmm. happening and then recontextualized or, or properly maybe contextualized things that had belonged in a room together mm -hmm. that hadn't been before. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that we're, we've also been able to do with this show is bring in these, these dialogues and these connections and, and put people in the company of their contemporaries or their mentors Mm -hmm. um, because there is a lineage and a dialogue there. And, and I think there's a dialogue amongst works um, by people who didn't know one another, right? Mm -hmm. Because history is important and it's the foundation mm -hmm. um, of what we know. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, it was wonderful to talk with you and to hear about your work and um, your response to Black American portraits. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> of, course. of course. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye.